This is Derry Hayes here live. Derry Hayes, the entertainer. Live with episode 16 of Life Skill, Life School. Will we tie our life skills into your life schools? And do me a favor, follow me on all social media platforms at Entertainer. That's E N T I E T A I N E R, the Entertainer. And even on Cash App, don't forget that. But see, speaking life into my dreams is a habit. And today, I'm here with Mr. Cabot, one of the biggest names in the game. I'm going to say that again. I told you when I first started, I told you when I first started, I was going to bring the biggest names in the game. Mr. Cabot, how are you doing today? I'm doing well, Derek. Thank you for having me today. Oh, it's a blessing. It's a blessing to have the connection. It's a blessing to, to, to have the opportunity to interview great people like yourself. Now, tell us about you, like your name, your, how, you, how, you, your, how you went to school, where you went to school, and where you're from, and what made you do uh, what you're doing now. Well, I was, I was born in upstate New York quite a while ago and uh, went to the University of Michigan undergraduate. I know you're out of the Chicago area, so I do apologize for that. Oh, no, uh, no, 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 no. <laughs> and I went to uh, Boston University Law School. And uh, when I got out of uh, school, I uh, started a sports marketing company, co-founded a sports marketing company with a friend of mine. And uh, about 1997, I started up an entertainment and sports law firm that uh, represents people in the entertainment and sports worlds, as well as other people in addition uh, to that who need our services. Currently, I'm an adjunct professor at uh, the Lubin School of Business, Pace University here in the city, and uh, looking forward to being here today. Man, man, that's a blessing. Now, you told us a little bit about yourself. Now, we're going to learn through your name, which is Cabot, C-A-B-O-T. That's right. So we'll get to know you through your name. We're going to get to know your game through your name. So the C is for corporate America. What are some things you do for people in corporate America? We really handle things for corporate America in a couple of different ways, Derek. I mean, first and foremost, we represent a number, hundreds of companies that are meeting uh, counsel with regard to their businesses, their employees. Right now, we're doing a lot of co with companies that are suffering under the uh, quarantine and are looking for financial assistance from the government or other agencies under the PPP program. We also do uh, a lot of branding with companies. So we'll align an athlete or an entertainer to get the message or the brand out there so that they can help drive traffic. Okay, the A is for athletes. You just mentioned athletes. Can you mention some of the athletes you work with and some of the other things you do with them? Sure. I've uh, been blessed over the last 30 years to work with a number of the great uh, athletes, uh, some of whom are no longer with us. Uh, uh, Yogi Berra, Don Shula, uh, uh, Ron Guidry, uh, Art Shamsky, Tom Seaver, uh, Harry Carson, uh, Lawrence Taylor. So I've had, I've had quite, a, uh, quite a run with it. Mike Ruzioni and Jim Craig among others from the uh, 1980 Olympic uh, hockey team, the Miracle on Ice team. So there's been a tremendous amount of uh, players. Uh, you know, uh, Ron Guidry just came out with a book. Uh, Doc Gooden came out with a book a couple of years ago. We've been working on that. And Art Shamsky of the Mets, 69 Mets, did a 50-year retrospective on uh, the Mets. So again, I'm, I'm not, I'm New York-centric, but we represent uh, athletes from all over the country. Yeah, I remember uh, the Miracle on Ice. You know, I was ten. I was, I was, I was ten years old. Uh, and Doc Gooden, you know, we always root for him because he fell down and got back up. Always root for Doc. Uh, yeah, Ron, Gidry, yeah Ron, Ron Guidry, Mr. New York. You know, uh, Harry Carson, the Giants. See, I'm, I'm a little, I'm a little younger, but you know, I'm still out of that hunger. You, you, the, you still know the guys. The the B the B is for businesses. What are what are some things you do for small to mid sized businesses? A lot of our clients are small and mid-sized businesses, Derek. So we act as a out-of-house, in-house counsel for businesses that are not able to or, or are not in need of a full-time legal staff or a full-time lawyer. 
this is able to give them representation at a, at a reasonable price when an issue arises. We also do a lot of post-career or, or during career representation for athletes or artists who are looking to put together a company to build towards their retirement or when they're no longer on the stage or on the field. So we work with those companies to help them get started, help them get funded, and make sure that they have uh, a good base for themselves. The O is for organizations. Are there any uh, organizations that you can mention or, or nonprofit or, you know, 5013Cs that you can discuss and, you know, how you work with them? Sure. Uh, a lot of our work uh, revolves around not-for-profits and organizations that have a social impact. We try to make sure that our clients are involved with those kind of organizations. Uh, personally, I do some work and, and I very, very strongly uh, feel about the Smile Train that helps kids with, uh, with surgeries for, for palate and other facial disorders when they're, when they're children. Uh, Sailor Freedom, I've worked with. Uh, they help uh, women who are trying to escape the sex trade. And uh, right now we're doing a lot of work with Opportunity Zones, which is building, in, uh, building affordable housing in areas that uh, need development and working with uh, clients and, and state and local governments for that. Oh, that's great. You mentioned uh, Sailor Freedom. I, I attended their uh, Super Bowl event uh, in Atlanta. Uh, that, was, that was a great event. Uh, the tears for territory as in, as, in, as in real estate. What are some things you do in real estate? Uh, real estate is, is a large part of our practice. As I, as I mentioned a moment ago, these opportunity zones that the government uh, put out there through the tax code last year allows people to invest in up and coming and developing areas. It doesn't always have to be real estate, but you're allowed to take some tax gains that you may have gotten and you don't need to uh, take tax gains, but you can invest in areas where they're looking to develop, whether it's uh, housing, commercial, or uh, just building up facilities and the businesses in those areas. So we work with a lot of companies uh, in that regard. We're also doing some work. We, we represent people for single family houses to uh, big real estate developments and we're everything in between. It's a, it's a good area where people can get involved in their community or get involved in projects that will really make an impact. Hey, I, I appreciate that. You got the, we, so far we learned something about your name and also about your game. You know, I teach people about the habits and now they just learned about Mr. Cabot. And now it goes to me to the, of, the, of the matter. A lot of people out there, you know, they don't get the opportunity to talk to a lawyer and attorney every day, and especially one that has vast experiences in different fields. And so a lot of times when I'm networking, I like to get other people involved. And so I ask them like different questions. And so Contreya, who is in, and these, these people from different parts of the country, so they was excited to to get they, their ideas, you know, get a chance to, you know, ask questions to. Sure. Big Happy to answer any questions that your audience has. So, so Katreya, who's in Columbus, Georgia, she says, what exactly does, her question is, what exactly does a real estate do, attorney do for the buyer? For the buyer, uh, Katreya, we are supposed to reduce any headaches that you would normally have with buying a home. So, for example, you're going to be dealing with a broker. You're going to be dealing with a, a, a seller. You're going to be dealing with a bank in all likelihood. You're going to be dealing with a title company. And these are complicated deals and complicated issues that most people, 99% of the population, would never have dealt with before or maybe only once or twice. My job is to make your life easier and to explain to you each step along the way what your bank is offering you and whether they're offering you a good deal, what conditions in your house or in your apartment are going to be once you make the purchase and what things are you not going to have the opportunity to take. If they're going to take a giant chandelier, you need to know that. If they're going to be making some changes to the, to the house, you need to know that ahead of time. And we'll take care of all of those things uh, from start to finish for our clients. Or any any attorney should be doing that for you in the real estate area. I appreciate that, Barry Brown. He's a uh, a music executive, and he would like to know how important is it for people to invest in real estate and or at least purchase a home to actually live in. 
Well, I think that purchasing a home is usually a great, uh, a great purchase on many different levels. Uh, first, it gives you a base that you can operate out of and you're using that real estate, which is always an important uh, asset. You don't want to take an asset that you get no real value out of and just hope that it, it increases in value. But also the government gives you a lot of tax benefits. If you own your own place, you can offset some income and therefore save money for you and your family to operate in. Also, real estate tends to appreciate over time. Not always, but often it, it tends to appreciate and also can get you into a community. If you move into a community, there's schools that you may want to participate in and other city or municipal events or uh, facilities that you get to be a part of. So I, I, I highly recommend that if, if it's in the cards and if it's something that you want to do. Obviously, you're devoting a lot of your assets and money to it, but it can be a, a very good benefit. Okay, I appreciate that. My, my friend Chris, he's a uh, he's a yoga. He calls himself the Yoga Doctor, and he has a studio okay. called he has a studio called the Art of Yoga. And well, he just awesome. wants to know how do you purchase properties via tax sales? Ooh, now you're getting now you're getting into the into the weeds there a little bit, Derek. Most cities and municipalities will put up for sale properties that people have failed to pay their taxes on or failed to pay other municipal uh, issues, water, uh, gas, uh, sewage. And you can buy them from the municipalities, but often you're not really buying them. You're just bailing out the municipality. So you're giving your money to the city and they're giving you the right to the property over a number of years. So they're not necessarily selling you the property, they're selling you the right to foreclose on the property and uh, take the property away from the person who may have abandoned it or otherwise walked away from it. So it's not as clean as the uh, municipality would want to have you believe it would be. Okay, okay. Now in the-, in the You can get some great deals there, but you're not, you're usually not getting the property anytime soon. You have to give notice to the person who owns it that you're looking to take it away from them. So the government gets its money and you get the right to uh, be a landlord, at least in the okay. beginning. Well, that, that's that's good to know because some people assume that, you know, they just go right in and get the house, you know, and keep moving. That would be great. But again, you usually almost always you have to give notice and a, and a good amount of time to the person or the company that had the property previously. Now, Steve Powell, we, we're going to go into uh, individual rights. Cause I, I went ahead and put the questions in, you know, different categories so we can hit a section of the two. Steve Powell was originally from Gary, Indiana. He grew up, do you remember Glenn Big Dog Robinson? Of course. Of course. Yeah, he, 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 him and, him and, him and uh, Big Dog were real good friends, but he wants to know, what does it take for minorities to have their human rights protected? I would like to say they should be protected from day one, and that shouldn't even be a question. But obviously, in this world, it is. I, I would every couple of years, it's just demonstrated again and again that society just had, or people within society, because I'm not going to generalize, you know, have to have to fight for their rights, which they should be given just by being in this country and, and being a law-abiding citizen. I mean, the fact of the matter is, if you're in this country, whether you're a citizen or not, everybody should have the same rights. And, and it's, it's ridiculous that we're talking about this uh, 150 years after, after the Civil War and, and 150 years after the 14th Amendment, which was supposed to put an end to any issues of of uh, a two two system, uh, you know, two two racial uh, profiling or any of these issues that are out there. But again and again, we're we're faced with issues where it proves that we still need to move further and we still need to to look into it. I don't have a great answer. I I mean, the the answer should be easy. It should be right. you already you were born with those rights, but unfortunately, uh, in some places at some times and possibly every place at some time. There, those issues and, and those rights are not not the same for everybody and have to be protected. Okay. My next question is from Tommy. Tommy is from Tucson, Arizona. And his question yeah. is, 
with Colin Kaepernick and the various others taking a knee to silently protest versus the cop nailing and killing Mr. Floyd. Yet his case and others are up in the air, which, you know, even last night there was some de decisions made toward that case. What can America expect going forward? Again, I would like to be able to tell you that the, those answers are, are very easy, but they're, they're extremely complicated. With regard to Mr. Kaepernick, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about him for a moment and then try to go into the bigger issue a, a little bit with regard to uh, police and, uh, and what they did uh, you know, in Minneapolis last, last week. With regard to Mr. Kaepernick, you know, he wanted to protest in his way what he felt was social injustice and police brutality that he had either faced or that friends of his had faced or people that he had heard of had faced. And the issue with him was really, I, I think it was twofold. The issue was first, whether the platform of a football or any sporting event should have that political element in it. And the other was that sports tries to bring teams together and whether an individual protest should have been supported by his teammates and whether they should have had that discussion amongst themselves and moved forward as a unified unit. And for those, again, you know, that, that's something that's more particular to Mr. Kaepernick. Uh, his actions again and again prove, not his actions, but what he did is again and again proven to be a hot issue and something that needs attention on a daily basis, unfortunately. Uh, with regard to what happened in Minneapolis, I was very happy to see that the four officers are now all facing charges, and also that the lead officer who was in charge at the time had his charges brought up to second degree murder. Uh, in every state, the charges of murder or murder in the first degree, murder in the second degree, in Minneapolis, murder in the third degree, all have different levels of evidence that you need. And, and the most important thing is that the prosecutor be able to prove a case. You don't want to ever lose a case by moving for something that you may not have the evidence for. And there's a long list of evidence that even technicalities would go into. So you want to make sure that people who are who are charged are in fact able to be prosecuted and punished under the law. And that's my hope. That's what's going to happen in Minneapolis. Yeah, thank you for that answer. If you're just tuning in, this is Derek Hayes. This is this is Cabot Marks. You know, I, I told you I was going to bring the biggest names in the game. Uh, Coach White, he would like to know how do you get a living will started. Okay, now that's that's again a little bit subjective to everybody, uh, depending on where they are located. So please take that with a grain of salt. By living will, do you mean like uh, for health issues, or do you mean a will that would be for um, you know, after you know, passed away? Yeah, after you passed away. Okay, uh, wills are very simple and very complicated. Usually, in most states, you need to sign them and have them witnessed by at least one, if not two or three people. In most cases, that's all that you need is to have the people see you say, this is my will and acknowledge that you did it, preferably by witnessing and saying that they witnessed it. In some states, especially with COVID and not being able to get together, you may do a Zoom call like we're doing now, and you can sign in front of witnesses. Each state has its own rules. Now, if you have children, you're going to want to put that information on who would take care of your children or who would support your children in your will. And if you have property or other things that may or may not be going to a spouse or a life partner or to your kids, you'd also want to specify that. Um, if you've got a World Series ring, for example, and you got two kids, you don't want them fighting about it. Right. You figure out which one is going to get it or uh, whether it's going to be put up for sale. And I've had to address that with some of our athletes. But uh, by and large, you, you just have to take the time to focus on that issue and the rest of it will come pretty easily, Derek. All right. This question comes from a minister. He's a minister and a pastor. 
His name is Darius Moore. He's got his hands full right now. Yeah, and Darius would like to know, when representing the client, do your morals and standards matter? Derek, I'm going to say that anybody that would represent you, you would hope that they have the highest standards and morals out there. Um, in any deal, anybody that you're going to contract with is only as good as their word. I, you and I can have a contract, but if I'm going to break it or you're going to break it, our only real recourse is to go to court. So if we don't have honor in what we deal with, then we were, we're starting at square one. But nobody should hire somebody for any job that they don't have trust in, that they don't have faith in, that they think will do something that's in their best interest and not in their client's best interest. Because that's what happens far too often, especially in the sports and entertainment world. The representation forgets that the talent is 99% of the deal and that making them happy and what their needs are is really what you're hired for. You're just there to really make sure that their life is better and easier. And that goes across any field. Hey, thank you for that answer. Uh, my friend, Latanya Tibbs, she's the creator of the V-Bar. That's, that's right. for women. The V-Bar is for women. And she says, is there a directory or organization that an artist or, or entertainer can go to to find PR, you know, management, and a lawyer without being ripped off? You know, okay. just because she's tired of seeing people, you know, taking bad deals. She's just asking, you know, looking out for the artist. Artists are always going to be uh, preyed upon. And what you're looking for in representation is somebody who will not do that. And what I mean by preyed upon, again, you're talking about people who have a unique talent, who have the ability to create something that I can't create, that you know other people can't create. So it's, it's always going to be a situation where everybody wants a piece of them but you, they've got to be able to be, find representation that they trust. Uh, on the other hand, you've got to remember that the people who are putting in the time and effort, especially if they're reputable, are taking their time and effort from other, other endeavors. So it's got to be a give and take situation regarding, uh, regarding that. But they should be able to find, I mean, there are agencies in most states or cities uh, that will provide you with a list of credible people or they should ask friends of theirs who are happy in the industry and they should try to get second and third opinions and bring in family members or other people just to give them advice on how do you select somebody. I wouldn't go to the yellow pages or just pick somebody with a flashy advertisement. Uh, usually you want somebody that you've spoken to and have a rapport with. I understand exactly what she's asking about because there are a lot of situations where there are unscrupulous agents. Most of them are, are are very fine individuals, but there are unfortunately a lot of stories of people who get taken advantage of. But the, the talent, it's a two-way street. The talent has to recognize and keep looking out for themselves too, to make sure that the person that they're entrusting is is has got their best interests at heart. Okay, I have a few questions on the on the athletic side. Let's go. Uh, one person wants to know, his name is Jared Legron. He uh entertainment manager, originally from Memphis, but lives in the Atlanta area. Okay. He wants to know, what are the rights of football players once they leave the game? And, he, and he's talking about over their name and memorabilia. You know, that was being sold by the NFL. And does their family receive any of the royalties? Okay, great question. I was down at the Super Bowl that Atlanta hosted, and it was just – Tremendous what they did down there. And I met so many new athletes, uh, both on the field as well as retired guys. And the issue is, if the NFL is truly selling their image, they should be benefiting. You own your image. You own your autograph. You own it when you're playing and you own it after you're playing. Now, what he may be referring to is a situation where certain teams and certain leagues claim that they have the rights to certain images of players either on video or during interviews or because pictures were taken during a game. And that's not really true in most instances. 
So guys who or, or women who are retired really have to work on the branding of their image and protecting their image because there's a lot of bad use or a lot of illegal or I don't want to say illegal because it may not be illegal. There's a lot of theft of identities of celebrities and players once they retire. They're entitled to be paid. Their families are entitled to be paid. And that money should be going to them. They may have, when they were playing, given some of those rights to a players association or their union. But those rights are not held by the NFL or any league. And they really have a right and they should do an accounting and check on all of those things. That's one of the things that we do for our client is to prosecute people who are using personal licensing rights of our clients illegally. A, f a few people would like to know, what is your take on college athletes getting paid? Again, it, that, that's a very complicated question. Are you saying, should they get paid? I would argue they are getting compensation. Are you saying that they should get additional compensation? I agree with you, that statement wholeheartedly. They're making a lot of money, but it goes deeper than that, Derek. The issue is these student athletes, and I'm talking about everybody across the board, these student athletes are putting in 30, 40, 50 hours on their job, which is to perform for their teammates, for their coaches, and for their universities, and ultimately for themselves. So you're talking about a situation of who should get the money? I would argue that the players should get greater compensation. Undoubtedly, they're given an opportunity in most cases for an education. And that education should be given to them if they're 18 or they decide to finish up their education when they're 80. That's what part of that deal is. In addition, though, these student athletes can't get a job. They can't go home and see their family. Their family may not be able to come and see them. Each of those athletes, in my opinion, should get some sort of compensation in the form of a stipend, an allowance. I don't know that I would call it, should they get paid, as in this is their job, because there's other issues that come into that. But they should definitely get money. Now, what I also have a problem with is some of the new laws that the NCAA is contemplating. I'm a player guy. I'm an athlete guy. I've always worshipped and been in awe of guys who can do on Saturday or athletes in general who have that skill. But now we're talking about a situation of, do we want 17-year-old kids to be making decisions on who gets to use their image? We, we prohibit kids from talking to agents or lawyers, but now we want younger kids to be able to sell the, their rights without any representation? That's exploiting these kids. You've got to give them a right to seek consultation, to make sure that what they're giving away, which is extremely valuable, is, is and they're getting full value. But let me give you another scenario. If you're only paying the star quarterback, then who really has the power? The coach that makes them the star or the starter who can pull that job away from them and take their money from them because it's not guaranteed. And then you're signaling out one player and saying that whole team serves that one player. And one of the things about the college experience is teamwork and building a team. And if you're going to pay the guy who throws the pass but not the guy who blocks for him, then you got a bunch of business decisions out there. And I'm not sure that I want to make the quarterback who may be an 18-year-old kid make the decision if he should be giving money away or even those players should get paid on their own because they're part of the team. I would give across the board a portion of the money that the universities get to every student athlete. You want to call it pay? Perhaps. You want to call it just compensation or part of their package? That may make it sound better to people. But someone's got to look out for these kids because nobody's looking out for the kids. Everybody's looking out for the money and what they can do with the money. Somebody's got to look out for these kids because they've got a special talent that the rest of us don't have. Okay, I have one entertainment question, then we're gonna finish up with a few uh, intellectual property questions. 
Okay, bring it on. All right. My friend Cool Water. Cool Water's his brand. So how I, I, I ever got his what his real name was, but Cool Water is his brand. He, he does a lot of digital business. You know, he does ebooks and uh he helps out with the uh the uh the much needed uh at risk youth population. That's his fantastic. question is how do you outdo a 360 deal? In a, okay. in a uh, great work uh, that Coolwater is doing. I mean, that, that's tremendous. I've worked with a couple of uh, sports, uh, youth sports programs here in, in the city, uh, LBX Sports and Yorkville Sports. And just working with kids is something, setting them, making sure that they have a solid base for their future is, is just tremendous. So I, I really applaud the work he's doing. The issue with the 360 agreement, and for people who may not be familiar with it, uh, a 360 agreement is when a performer, and it could be an athlete, but, but athletes run their businesses a little differently. When you give your agency a percentage of all of the money that you make. So if you're in a concert, they get a percentage. If you're cutting a, a record, they get a percentage. They get a percentage of your downloads. And often this may be by far the larger percentage because in the record deals, if that's the typical deal, the record company gets the majority of the money and you either get an advance or a percentage of royalties that might be nine to 15%, which can still add up to a tremendous amount of money. But now if you're giving away 90% of your movie opportunities and your performing opportunities and your apparel opportunities. That's a tremendous amount to be given away. And that's what the kids are giving away in the 360. Now, on the other hand, why are they doing it? It may be that they don't have representation. And again, this comes back to corporate America exploiting our, our young adults and, and people and taking advantage of them. But also it comes back to if I'm a record label, I got a thousand people who want me to give them a lot of money to do something they love and give them a recording contract and a studio and spending money up front. If every time I put a deal in front of those thousand people and one of those thousand people makes it rich and I've got a get that, let them leave their contract, then I don't have the money to bring in those thousand people who are all trying to get a contract and get the opportunity to be heard. Now that said, these contracts are usually horrible contracts. There have been instances where performers can get out of them. Maybe they were underage. Maybe they were under the influence. Maybe the recording company broke their part of the deal. Remember, just because it's a one-sided deal doesn't mean that the recording company doesn't have obligations to the talent. And maybe they're breaking that deal. I think uh, Little Wayne had, had the same situation a number of years ago, and he was able to get out of his 360 deal. But a contract is a contract. My, right. uh, my younger daughter would say, you know, you get what you get and you don't get upset in that if you're taking their money and you're taking their publicity and their marketing, you gotta give something back. You don't wanna be taken advantage of, but it's gotta be a win-win deal for everybody. Okay, I appreciate that. that. That gives me some insight on 360. You know, I ain't never did a no 360, but you know. I would avoid it if you can, but uh, again, in some cases it works out famously. So that, that you know, it, it can be a win-win. Oh, we're going to touch on uh, intellectual properties before we close out. Okay. My friend John in, in uh, Houston, Texas, he said a great question. He knows the answer, but he thought a great question for others would be, how do you find and partner with an attorney on intellectual property deals where they take a percentage of future earnings by acti actively protecting the value of the intellectual property you create? That's an amazing question. That's a, that's a really good question. Certain firms, first I should say that intellectual property is somewhat of a specialty. So there aren't a lot of firms. I mean, there's a lot of firms, but there's not a large percentage of the overall firms that do intellectual property. 
And there's probably not a lot of those firms that do intellectual property who are able, either because they're entrepreneurial based or if they have what might be a pro bono operation or just because they need to get paid, who are willing to do that. Our firm has occasionally been involved in those kind of programs. So I can give you a little bit of insight into it, Derek. And again, it's a, it's a great question. I usually find that somebody who's got a great intellectual property really doesn't want to share that with a with an attorney. Uh, they might want to share it with investors, friends and family, or somebody who's going to give them a lot of money. But I'm not sure that those people want to give equity generally out to their lawyer. Usually or hopefully the legal fees are somewhat within reason. And therefore, if they can raise money and protect their equity, especially if it's worth a lot, they're usually more inclined to do that. But if they, I mean, they should shop for an attorney. I mean, I don't think it would be that hard if you're willing to give away equity to find a lawyer, might be a, a young lawyer, might be a solo practitioner, might be somebody who's already involved in the business that they want to go into that are willing to take that risk on the product, take that risk on the person, because you're really investing in two things. The product, the intellectual property, which might be famous or known somewhere, and the individual who's coming to you. I try to go you know, with the person who's got the idea, people with good ideas who are working hard and have that ability and that drive, I'll bet on them every time over an idea that's out just out there with somebody who might not want to follow it because hard work and grinding and drive is, is really what does it. And if a person like that comes to you, you should take that equity and they'll, they'll have no problem. I think finding somebody, they may have to go around the block a few times, find two or three people, but they'll find somebody if they're one of those people who ha who's driven like that. Hey, thank you for that answer. My sister, Pam, she, She's she's a uh, a prime America expert out of Brooklyn, New York. Uh, Brooklyn, and, my wife's from Brooklyn. I got and, and my parents are from Brooklyn. Yeah, he's he's New York best guy. Yeah. Now her question is with with trademarks, patents, and copyrights. What should she keep in mind to pick a good protectable name? <sighs> See, there's a couple of ways to look at that question. When you look at Google or you look at Amazon, what you notice is that those words don't necessarily mean anything. And what I mean by that is they made up, a, obviously, Amazon, Amazon River, but Google doesn't necessarily mean anything. So they're stepping on no toes by making up a word and putting it out there. Now, they've made it famous. They've done their brand. Coca-Cola did their brand a hundred years ago, but they made up a word. So nobody could say that they didn't make up that word. Nobody can attack you unless they've already made up, made up a word that you just made up. Now, when you're picking a brand though, you want to pick something that people think of when they're, they're going to see your product. And again, that's product specific. But if you're going to pick something, especially multi words or especially something that has your business in the name, uh, you're not going to necessarily be able to protect that. It's going to be known as generic or something that's unprotectable. Now, there's ways around that. But if you're going to put in your your uh, Derek real estate, the real estate part will not be protected. Now, Derek Hayes real estate you probably could protect the Derek Hayes, but you may need a logo in order to say I'm different from any other Derek's or any other Hayes's out there. So it really depends on how you're trying to do it. Now, let me give you a little bit of a switch. If you're copywriting something, you don't have to file. The copyright is when you create it. Now, you would want to file because that would be an extra protection. But if you come up with a song or a poem or a lyric, that 
becomes, as soon as you really put it in what they call tangible form, you write it down, you show other people, making sure that, they, that you can trust them, you own that. Now, what can you do with it? That's up to you. And there are, you know, if you're working for a company, they may own anything you create. And that's what really usually happens. So people say, look, I was on the job and I created this. Why does my boss think that they own it? I created it. Well, if you're taking a paycheck for them or if you sign off on something and take the money, then they own it. So you want to be careful that what you're doing is not what's known as a work for hire, that you own what you create. So I wouldn't do these creations while you're at work. I do them when you're at home or out with family on your own time so that your boss can't say, I'm paying you for eight hours a day and you're creating these, these brands. I own these brands. All right. So that's great question. Yeah. Mr. Williams, he's a director of a, a, a group called Distinguished Gentlemen. And what, it, what the group is all about, he brings in young men to teach them about uh, etiquette. You know, I volunteer from time to time, teaching them how to tie ties, uh, neckties, bow ties, and I even made some ties. I that bow tie. I, 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 to this day, still have problems. Oh, uh, you know, you know, for a small fee, you know, we might be able to barter a little bit. We'll be able to barter, definitely. <laughs> but he, he, he was like, he was just curious. He was like, what percentage of intellectual property is stolen on a, a yearly basis? I'll, again, I, I hate to answer a question with a question. How much of that intellectual property is worth something? Because if the intellectual property isn't worth anything, I don't know that anybody's going to take the time to steal it. Right. But out of the intellectual property that's worth something, I would say at least a third of it, if not properly protected and if not followed up, may have some people who intentionally or maybe unintentionally are using or abusing things that they don't have a right to do. Because getting the, the rights to it is one thing. I recently did a trademark for one of our athletes and we, trans, we took one of his nicknames and we trademarked it. But there were a number of youth organizations, a football team and a couple of baseball teams that used a similar type of name. We went and we talked to those not-for-profits and we gave them the right to use it. They didn't realize that they were using something that my client was protecting. They just liked the name, which is why we liked the name. You know, both of us liked the name, but my guy had filed and my guy had used it since before these kids were born. And so we made a deal where they acknowledge that my guy is this name, but that they could use it for their youth program so that, you know, it was a win-win situation. Right. Great, great youth program. We're more than happy to share with them, uh, you know, but uh, they can't claim that they're my, you know, my celebrity. As long as the two are fine, I, we're fine with that in, in that instance. The last question uh, with uh, intellectual property is my brother, David, he's in Rancho, Illinois. And he liked to know why does America not defend the intellectual property and intellectual property rights of Americans and American companies, especially from the Chinese? We don't, uh, as we started the conversation a little bit about, we don't protect anything or we can't protect everything at once. I mean, right now we're working on personal freedoms and, and equality. Um, I'm not going to say we can only do one. We're a great country. We can do so many different things. But like human rights and issues that we have with many governments, including the Chinese, uh, they don't respect our intellectual property whatsoever. The government, through many administrations, has been trying and trying hard to protect American companies. Uh, we're talking entertainment, music, and otherwise. But that's patents. That's drugs. That's hardware. That's billions of dollars that American companies are spending to develop ideas that the Chinese are, are stealing, as are other countries. I mean, that's something that the government is very, uh, very much trying to enforce, but getting very much uh, a deaf ear from the Chinese and other, other countries. Uh, 
anybody with intellectual property really has to be careful if it's something that they think internationally people are going to try to pirate from them. Hey, I, I just want to, from the bottom of my heart, I just want to thank you for, you know, taking your time today and answering each and every question. Uh, before we close, do you have any last remarks or anything, any information on how people can reach out to you or, you know, any projects you're working on? Okay. Uh, th thank you, Derek. Um, my firm, Marks D. Palermo, is you can reach us uh, at Marks D. Palermo. That's M A R K S D I P A L E R M O dot com. And that's got our information. Uh, our office is 212 370 4477. And even though we're working remotely, uh, you can you can get us there. Uh, my, as you mentioned before, my my Insta handle and my Twitter handle are, are out there. And uh, it's uh, Cabot NYC or at Cabot NYC. And uh, looking forward to connecting with anybody. Right now, one of the couple of the things that we're working on is, as I mentioned before, is hopefully the rebuild coming out of the quarantine. If it's an individual or if it's a person, either building or helping them uh, do something in their community. Uh, on the charitable end, we're always looking to brand with people. And we're also uh, going to be opening what's known as a home office to help be a fiduciary and responsible for uh, helping people with their family issues, with their professional issues, and with their parental issues. I don't mean that their children, although we're happy to do that. But, you know, people our age, our parents might be getting older, and there's a lot of information that you do. You know, they raised us. Hopefully we can help raise, you know, make them uh, make the end of their lives and the last quarter of their, you know, of their lives as wonderful as possible. So we, we want to act as a, uh, as a one place uh, shopping for, uh, for legal advice and information. Uh, to, to a large extent, we're not selling that. We'd like to be able to provide it and help people make those decisions. And uh, that would be great. I'm, I'm happy to talk to anybody and uh, look forward to an opportunity to speak to you, Derek, uh, again in the future. Hey, I just want to thank you uh, for coming on Life Skill, Life School. And thank each and every one of you that's still out there listening. Tune in Monday, June 8th at 12 noon, as I get my first virtual keynote address entitled, All I Need is One Tie. And on Tuesday, June 9th, oh, I have BDB, Brenda DeBerry, who was a broker and life coach. And on Thursday, June 11th, we'll have Alan Alford, who's the number one salesperson in the history of Geico. This is a great show from the one that speaks habits and from the lawyer in the name of Cap. So follow me on all social media platforms at The Entertainer. And remember, keep working on your skills because when people see what you do, it may be the only school that they ever see. Until next time, thank you for your time. Thank you, Derek. Thank you.